All right. Today is Sunday, May 23rd. This is a recap for the stock market activities last week and an outlook of the week to come. The market is in an indecision mode and you will see that clearly when we do the charts analysis because the weekly closings, whether we're talking about the VIX, yields, the dollar index, the SPY, the Qs, all closed without giving us a definitive signal. For example, when it comes to the VIX, we were anticipating a definitive closing around the level of 20. Closing the week decisively below 20 will be a bullish signal for the market. Closing the week decisively above 20 would have been a bearish signal for the stock market. Well, guess what? The VIX closed exactly at 20. Likewise, when it comes to the US dollar, we were eyeing the level of 90 and we were anticipating a definitive closing around this level, decisively above it or decisively below it. Well, guess what? The dollar index closed exactly at 90. Likewise, when it comes to yields, we were waiting for a definitive closing around the level of 1.62 basis points. A definitive weekly closing above or below the level. Well, guess what? We closed exactly at 1.62 basis points. So the market is leaving us hanging there on the edge of our seats. But once you start to peel the onion a little more, you will find signs for danger and signs to become extremely cautious. And this is exactly what I did in my own portfolio. De-risking using options strategies, whether it is buying puts on certain names or selling puts on others, or whether it is taking profits off the table entirely. And the reason is the market is lacking clarity. And this is one thing the stock market doesn't like, the lack of direction. Where does this lack of direction stems from? The Federal Reserve and Papa Jerome Powell. They continue to tell us that they're not thinking about thinking about thinking about raising interest rates or even tapering. They also keep touting the transitory narrative that inflation is transitory. And this is confusing the market because the market is processing the data day by day. You have the CPI pointing to higher inflation, but then you have retail sales flat. You have the Philly Manufacturing Index cooling off. This is the headline reading, the business activity for the Philly Manufacturing Index. But within the same report, the prices paid reached the highest level since 1980. What happens when inflation rises higher, prices continue to climb higher and higher, but business activities cool off. In addition, employment losing ground in terms of the recovery. What do these conditions point to? Rising inflation, a weak jobs market, and certain business activities cooling off. These are all signals and indicators for, we can't say it, but here it is, stagflation. Anyhow, the Fed continues with its propaganda playbook giving us a vague outlook. And the market is not liking that one bit. We talked about not thinking about thinking about thinking about. Okay. The other thing is the Federal Reserve says we're looking to average inflation at 2%. Okay. Are you using any formula, any framework, any guideline to average inflation at 2%? Nope. The Federal Reserve and Papa Jerome says we're not guided by any formula. They're just going to eyeball inflation. All of this lack of clarity is hurting the stock market and the market does not like the lack of clarity. It's going to give it a little time. It's going to tolerate it for a little while. But at the end of the day, the market will throw a fit because this is one thing the market does not like, the lack of clarity. And right away, you're seeing profit taking now storming the inflationary trade and value stocks, massive declines in the inflationary trade and even the reopening trade. You're seeing market participants saying, I want to de-risk. I want to take profits off the table because I don't have any clarity at any guideline on where should I allocate my investment next because the Federal Reserve remains extremely vague. We're also seeing oversold bounces in the high multiple technology names and these oversold bounces are not going to last for too long. Absent of clear guideline from the Federal Reserve. The other thing we're seeing this week, and over the weekend, by the way, is the mass liquidation event in cryptos. Massive declines in Bitcoin, Doge, Ethereum, across the board. Mass liquidation event, and that goes hand in hand with the de-risking mode in the market. That perhaps the best days of the bubble is behind us, and the bubble is popping as we speak, and it is time 
to de-risk and the market is changing from becoming an easy market of put your blindfolds on and pick a stock out of a hat and you get to score big those days are over and now we're getting into a more difficult terrain to navigate and the purpose of this channel of course is for me to do my best to study and analyze everything for you to help you navigate this difficult terrain we have a lot to talk about so let's not waste any more time and start by covering the market's performance on friday and here we go the Dow Industrial Average closing in the green by 123.69 points or a gain of 0.36%. The Nasdaq closing in the downside by 64.75 points or a decline of 0.48%. The S&P 500 also in the red down by 3.26 points or a decline of 0.48%. 0.08%. What about the sector's performance on Friday? We saw a comeback, a slim one, for the inflationary trade. Of course, the inflationary trade has been the underperformer this week. But on Friday, we started to see some dip buying in the inflationary trade. And finishing the day at number one, capturing the gold medal, financials. And perhaps financials is the only safe sector in the market, along with some healthcare names. At number two for the silver, utilities. The number three for the bronze, industrials. Meanwhile, leading the declines on Friday, consumer cyclicals, technology, and communication services. Now, let's contrast that with the weekly performance. At number one, capturing the gold medal, healthcare. And by the way, this is the second week in a row where healthcare overperforms the broader market. At number two for the silver, real estate the number three for the bronze technology meanwhile the laggards for the week the inflationary trade led by materials energy and industrials what about the market breadth on friday for the NYSE, 57% advancing versus 40% declining. For the NASDAQ, even though closing in the red, the breadth was okay. 53% advancing versus 43% declining. Moving on to futures, what's going on here? We're seeing a rebound in crude oil prices. Big gains for the WTI and crude oil Brent. The WTI finishing the day with gains over 3%. Meanwhile, Brent closing the week, excuse me, the day with gains of about 2.5%. At softs, we're seeing a comeback for lumber futures here, rebounding higher. And the question is, is the sell off in lumber over? And now we're seeing dip buying panicking once again and buying lumber futures because among the inflation deniers, the likes of the Fed and uh, Tesla witch Kathy Wood, who actually came out and said the risk is for de inflation. Anyways, who cares? But one of their argument is that lumber futures went down over 20%. That was a steep correction and perhaps a signal that inflation is indeed transitory. But watch out here what your assumptions are because lumbar is making a comeback. We will see how far the comeback in lumbar go. And this is one of the reasons behind the confusion the market is suffering from. There is an absence of a clear guideline. Is it transitory? Is it not transitory? We're not sure anymore. This is what the market is saying. Of course, you and I, we know exactly what's going on. Once you unleash inflation out of the box, the genie goes out and he cannot not put it back in the box easily it has to go through and finish its process that could take month it can take years or even decades depending on the various factors we know that the increase in money supply the rapid increase in a very short amount of time that will indeed create inflation and it will be very hard to argue that it is transitory because the psychological elements starts to take over for example, if you and I expect that prices will continue to go higher and inflation fears start to creep up uh, the consumer sentiment, we will start buying now before prices go higher and therefore it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Likewise, when companies realize that, hey, if we raise prices and the consumer just pays, then we just improved our margins. Why would we go back and reduce prices again? Once companies and corporations realize that they can do price gouging, increase prices and the consumer will be just fine with it there is no going back and the same can be said with wage inflation by the way anyhow back to the futures we also saw gains for cotton futures on friday and modest gains for coca and oj futures meanwhile the declines in soft futures led by sugar and coffee what about metals gold muted gold giving mixed signals here not sure about which direction it's going to go next of course, gold follows yields. We have an inverse 
relationship between gold and yields. When will that reverses, meaning the inverse relationship? Who knows? But for now, gold is not a reliable hedge against inflation. Given the multi-year inverse relationship between gold and yields. But once that starts to reverse, then gold becomes a hedge against inflation. So we are watching that relationship, whether gold will go up hand in hand with yields or not. Meanwhile, we saw the correction resuming in metals futures, big declines led by palladium, platinum, silver, and then copper futures. What about meats? No correction here. Meats have strong tailwinds to rise higher, specifically lean hogs. You're not going to cure the shortage of lean hogs by printing 3D pigs. Doesn't happen that way. The demand continues to skyrocket. Meanwhile, the supply is nowhere to be found. We're seeing massive gains here for lean hogs futures. Likewise, when it comes to feeder and live cattle futures, also gaining ground here. And the reason is the rise of grains is increasing the input prices of meats in general. This is pushing meats futures to ride higher. And those increases in prices are being passed down all the way to the end customer. What about grains? The correction resumes here just slightly we are watching corn this is the most important future in grains corn massive correction from the highs and the correction is still going on we also saw declines for canola futures meanwhile modest declines across the board whether we're talking about soybeans soybean meal soybean oil wheat rough rice and oats futures there are different dynamics here when it comes to grains for example we have a massive drought here in the u.s at least in the southwestern part of the u.s and the corn belt by the way illinois the midwest etc we also have a drought in Brazil. The Brazilian crop output is extremely slim this year. Meanwhile, we have the Australian output actually increasing because the weather is more favorable over in Australia right now for farmers than it is in the US and Brazil. Moving on to options, the big casino, what's going on here? Finishing the day at number one, the hottest table in the casino, Apple, with almost 1.2 million contracts, about 68% of those were calls. At number two, Ford, massive gains for Ford on Friday, matter of fact, for the entirety of the week. And the reason is the reveal of the new pickup truck, the electric F-150. And at number three, Tesla, with about 850,000 contracts, about 60% of those were calls. We are also seeing some retail participation they're not all dead by the way and that is evident by the call options volume for names like AMC and Palantir which are some of the retail crowds favorite names moving on to the unusual trades that took place in the options market on Friday starting with the ticker MDLZ this is for Mondelez a name that I own in my portfolio and it is a perfect hedge against inflation and against the collapse of the US dollar because Mondelez makes a lot of revenue overseas and of course they have a pricing advantage they can raise prices and there isn't a damn thing that you and I can do about it we're just gonna pay more and here we have a bullish bet for Mondelez by buying the 67 and a half calls expiration date June 18th with expectations that the name will rise over six and a half percent by then they paid about 18 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all bringing the total to about eight hundred thousand dollars what about the trade for the ticker ftai this is for fortress transportation it's an infrastructure name and this trade is highly unusual we're seeing elevated levels of call options buying in this name something is brewing for this name in this case they're buying the 32 calls expiration date june 18th with expectations that the name will rise over 10% by then. They paid about 55 cents a piece to enter this trade. All in all, bringing the total to about $800,000. What about the trade for the ticker DHI for DR Horton? Home builders got whacked severely this week. Matter of fact, for a couple of weeks here. In relation to lumbar prices, the moment we saw lumbar prices collapsing, you saw lots of pain for these home builder prices. The question is, now that lumbar futures are rebounding higher, will these home builders, the likes of DR Horton, Lennar, Tall Brothers, will they also rebound higher? The charts are certainly not looking good. And here we have somebody betting against the name, betting for further declines to come for DHI. 
by buying the 80 puts expiration date July 16. With expectations that the name will drop over 11% by then, they paid about a buck and 29 cents a piece to enter this trade. All in all, bringing the total to about $1.8 million. What about the trade for the triple Qs, the NASDAQ? We saw lots of short covering, lots of oversold bounces in the tech sector, whether it is the semiconductor names or the software names. And that contributed to a lot of technical repair in the Nasdaq charts. However, there are bets that the pain will resume when it comes to the Nasdaq. Once the short covering and the oversold bounces are over, we will resume the sell-off. At least, this is what the trade is predicting because they're buying the 305 puts expiration date July 2nd with expectations that the triple Qs will decline over 7% by then. They paid about 3 bucks and 85 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all bringing the total to about 4 $4.6 million. What about the trade for the ticker RBLX? Roblox. The name climbed significantly higher after earnings, double digit gains. It is still overvalued, but it has a lot of tailwinds behind it. It is a promising company. I wouldn't buy it because of the valuations but I would definitely trade it. And this is one of the ways you can trade the upside in Roblox. In this case, they're buying the 95 calls expiration date June 4th with expectations that the name will rise over 15% and notice the short expiration date. They're not expecting the name to continue to rise higher all the way to the end of the year. They're making a short term trade that the gains in the name are not over yet. We haven't seen the top in this name. This is at least what the trader is saying from this bet. And they Paid about one buck and thirty-five cents a piece to enter the trade. All in all, bringing the total to about one point three million dollars. What about the trade for the ticker ARKKKK goes? ARK Invest, the poster child of this correction. And what's wrong with the market, by the way? Kathy Wood continues to be erratic, making impulsive moves left and right. For example, selling Apple and using the money to buy the dip in speculative names. And by the way, this is an ETF that has buys and sells pretty much every day. Kathy Wood is investing and trading like an 18 years old Robin Hood trader in, out, in, out of positions with no clear direction. And pretty soon, ARK Invest Investors will start to pull their money out. And if we see a mass liquidation event in RKK, boy, this will be one of the major events of this bubble. ARK could collapse entirely because the concentrated positions that ARK Invest has in certain stocks. So if we see a mass liquidation event in ARK Invest ETFs, that will seal the deal. The crash will happen across the market. If ARK Invest falls, the market will fall down with it. In this case, somebody's betting for more pain to come here for RKK by buying the 99 puts expiration date June 4th with expectations that the name will drop over 6.5% by then and they paid about 1 buck and 70 cents a piece to enter this trade. All in all, bringing the total to about $1.7 million. What about the trade for the ticker UVXY? This is a proxy for the VIX. And pay attention here because we seldom see massive bets for the UVXY because it is highly volatile. And if your timing is wrong, you're likely to lose money fast. So when I see a massive call option trade for the UVXY, that tells me there is a conviction that the VIX will pop higher very soon and we will see the correction in the the broader market continuing. In this case, they're buying the five bucks calls for the UVXY expiring July 16th. They are expecting the name to pop higher by the tune of 14% or more. By then, they paid about 90 cents a piece to enter this trade. All in all, bringing the total to about $700,000. What about the trade for the ticker VXX? This is another VIX proxy. And in this case, they're buying the 47 calls expiration date May 28th, meaning this upcoming week, with expectations that the VXX will pop over 19%. Very interesting. They paid about at 50 cents a piece to enter this trade. All in all, bringing the total to about $400,000. This is extremely interesting. When you look at the charts, the VIX still has the potential of a massive pop very, very soon. And this is one way to play a potential pop in the VIX. And by the way, when the VIX pops, what happens to the SPY? It drops. Inverse relationship. My hunch is the correction is not over and it will start to resume very soon. By very soon, I mean this upcoming week. And these traders, at least for the VXX, are agreeing 
with me. Moving on to the heat map analysis and let's see what's going on. This is the weekly heat map, by the way. Right away, looking at the inflationary trade, lots of profit taking this time around from energy industrials. Take a look at a name like Deer, for example, one of the best performers for the year. Massive declines by the tune of 6% or more this week alone. So we are seeing lots of profit taking in the inflationary trade. And the question remains, will the dip be bought in these names or not? Assuming that the monetary policy and the macroeconomics environment remains the same, then the dip should be bought in these names. But once again, the Federal Reserve is giving us a vague outlook. They are playing poker and the market is lacking clear directions. Anyhow, you're seeing the profit taking also hitting materials specifically copper, chemicals, agricultural products, steel, aluminum, all declining. Meanwhile, it was an excellent week for gold miners. And notice the trend. Gold rising higher when the inflationary trade is underperforming. And what is overperforming this week? Software names, chip names, the mania high multiple names, and gold is outperforming along with these names. Meanwhile, gold was underperforming when the inflationary trade was in favor. What does that tell you? Gold for now is not a reliable hedge against inflation. Inflation. Here's another inflationary trade for financials. But notice the difference between financials, the performance that is, of financials and say energy and industrials. Financials holding a lot better because this is the Goldilocks environment for financials. The yield curve is steepening and the outlook for inflation continues to get hotter and hotter. One of the safest places right now in the market is financials, even though the sector is technically overbought and we could see a correction, a big one heading financials. That will be definitely an opportunity to buy. What about the healthcare sector? This is the quiet soldier. While we're seeing a storm hitting the market, whether it is the disinflationary trade or the inflationary trade, technology, high multiple, etc., etc. The healthcare sector remains steady, specifically when it comes to the big drug manufacturers. In addition to the health insurers, United Health, Anthem, etc., these have been overperforming the broader market for at least a couple of weeks. Notable mentions here we have Target also rising higher on the heels of earnings. Likewise, we have a name like HRL, Hormel Foods, also rising over 6% for the week on the heels of earnings. And by the way, you gotta read this transcript the earnings for Hormel. They're saying that they're raising prices across the board and they're not intending anytime soon to take these price hikes off the table. They're saying that these price hikes are permanent. And the reason is they now know that the consumer is willing to pay more. You see how inflation works? You unlock the psychology and now corporations say, well, wait a minute here. The customer is willing to pay more. Why not take advantage of that and increase our margins? There is no going back once you unlock that part of the psychology when it comes to inflation. We already talked about the overperformance of Ford in the auto manufacturer's names. Another notable mention is the underperformance of AT&T, Comcast, and Discovery. We have this mess, the acquisition deal, and of course the market is not liking that. And we saw AT&T being punished severely. AT&T down about 7% for the week. Comcast down over 6% for the week. And Discovery down over 11% this week alone. The overperformance in the tech sector is coming from an oversold bounce, some short covering in the chip manufacturers and the software names. We saw massive declines in the past few weeks in the IGV and software stocks, and here we're seeing some dip buying combined with short covering and oversold bounces. Yet the big cap technology names, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook, all underperforming Closing in the red or flat, with exception of Google, Google remains the overperformer when it comes to big cap technology names. But looking at the chart, that is also about to come to an end. The last notable mention here for the week is NVIDIA, NVDA. The name popped higher on Friday because they announced a stock split. This is too late. These stock splits should have happened last year. Now the management figured out that perhaps the price is too high for retail traders and the likes to push NVIDIA higher and perhaps a stock split is a good idea. The problem is, it is too late and the bears will split NVIDIA prices organically via a massive correction because the name is overvalued and we are seeing these high multiple names being trimmed 
across the board. What about the themes analysis? Starting with the nostalgia names, aka the reopening names. We're seeing declines across the board with very few exceptions. Once again, lots of profit taking in these high performers specifically the names that are already recovered. The pre-pandemic highs, there is a sell the news type of phenomena as we start to see the economy reopens. The question remains, will the dip be bought in these names because the macroeconomics and the outlook for the economy, consumer spending and the likes, is still favorable, specifically for those services names, the likes of Royal Caribbean, Airlines, Live Nation, AMC, Six Flags, amusement parks, casinos, all these services and experiential stocks have a lot of tailwinds to come. On the other hand, the products part of the reopening names the likes of retail not performing as good perhaps the tailwinds have already came by and left because we saw retail spending plateaus after the stimulus checks were already spent meaning that the customer is spending the stimulus check the extra money they don't need in buying stuff that they don't need surprise surprise the question is will the consumer continues to spend in retail businesses this upcoming summer out of their own savings that is the million dollars question when it comes to retail what about the high inflation stocks we have declines across the board here with very few exceptions and once again this is exactly what you wanted to see if you are bullish on these names or you've been waiting and waiting to buy the dip the question is when you see a name like alcoa down over 10 percent last week down another 9% this week. So we saw about 20% correction in the name. Do you have the balls to buy the dip? Because investors always say, oh, I like the name, but it is too high right now. It is overvalued. I am waiting for a dip and then I'll buy the name. Well, here is your dip. Are you buying or are you not buying? The problem is the lack of clarity once again from the Federal Reserve. And therefore you're seeing lots of profit taking regardless if you're up 40, 50% in Alcoa, why wouldn't you book profits right now and see what happens later? You can always re-enter the trade and therefore you're seeing lots of declines here for these inflationary names. What about stocks that thrive under low inflation and low interest rates? We're seeing gains rebound big ones, specifically in the high multiple names. However, there is a theme within a theme of the declines in cryptos and Bitcoin in specific, and therefore you're seeing an underperformance from Square, Tesla, even ARK Invest should have been a lot higher this week, but once again, there are heavy investors in Coinbase and Bitcoin and that is contributing to the tame performance for ARK Invest. And by the way, you see DR Horton down big for the week, almost 6%, and that opens the path for a debate whether DR Horton home builders should be considered under low inflation stocks or inflationary stocks because it seems that these names have been gaining along with the inflationary trade. I continue holding to my guns that home builders thrive under low inflation because there is a threshold when yields reach this particular threshold you will see the fortunes turn in the housing mania because mortgage rates will also rise higher initially that will scare buyers into stampeding and buying homes before rates go higher. But at some point, when mortgage rates reach 4%, 5%, that will pop the housing bubble and you will see housing prices also going down. You have names like DR Horton building houses as we speak right now, incurring the extra cost of building these homes. But by the time they finish it, perhaps inflation will go too high, mortgage rates will rise too high, and we will see the appetite of chasing homes also going away. And therefore, they're going to lose a lot of money selling these homes because they built them in a certain period of inflation and they are going to sell them in a different period of inflation, perhaps the ugly period of inflation. I hope that makes sense. If it doesn't, who cares? Because we're moving on to the charts analysis, starting with... 30 minutes chart for the SPY, the S&P 500. Here is the chart with no new markings or annotations by me. The chart went all the way to break the resistance of 417.30 only to get rejected and reverse from that point on. One way to look at the chart is going all the way to close the gap as you can see from this yellow line and then reversing lower. This is not a bullish signal. What you want to see is closing the gap and then continuing to rise higher. Here's another way to look at the chart. This is a reversal candle or you could call it a rejection candle from 417.30. Here's another way to look at the chart. This is looking as 
a head and shoulder topping formation. And by the way, this is not the first time the SPY gets rejected from 417.30. This remains to be a sticky, difficult resistance to break above. Another way to look at the chart is that this is a bear flag formation and it should indeed take the chart lower. How low? How about the center of gravity at 412? Let's start by that and then take it day by day. And by the way, remember, this is a 30 minute scope. It is extremely limited, so you have to look at the daily charts. Here it is, the continuous contract of the SPY, daily perspective. We talked about the wedge formation and I told you that the candle from Friday will be extremely important because it will tell us one way or the other where the wedge breakout will happen, up or down. Well, guess what? The chart closed exactly within the wedge. It went a little higher, only to reverse lower by the end of the day, closing exactly at the edge of the wedge, meaning indecisive closing for now. And this is exactly what I talked about during the intro of this video. The charts are indecisive and they are keeping us on the edge of our seats. The negative divergence in the RSI is still here and the negative trend in momentum from the MACD indicator is also still here. What about the Qs? 30 minutes chart. The NASDAQ rising all the way to the level of 330 and a half, that is the resistance, and then pulling back from that point on. And I highlighted for you that the Qs pulled back from this level of the RSI at least two times before, with 30 minutes perspective. And the expectations were that the NASDAQ will pull back again from that level. And this is exactly what happened on Friday. We have a soft support at 326, but the center of gravity remains 323. We have a gap to fill over there, so perhaps the queues will go all the way down to 323, fill that gap, and then we'll take it from there. Zooming out. The Nasdaq futures, the chart started to look a little better by correcting some of the negative divergence in the RSI and curling upward in the MACD indicator. But it is too soon to say that this was the bottom and we have clear skies ahead for the Nasdaq. And the reason is the chart failed to break above 13,599 by the end of the week. And you gotta use your head a little bit here because we're seeing oversold bounces short covering in certain names in the Nasdaq. That will indeed contribute to pushing the Nasdaq chart higher. But what happens after the short covering and the oversold bounces are over? Do we resume the sell-off once again? That remains the question. And by the way, I am eyeing 13,300. Closing below that level from a daily basis will confirm that this was not the bottom and we have lower prices to come for the Nasdaq. Moving on to the IWM, 30 minutes chart, closing the gap and then opening another gap higher during Friday's session. But by the end of the day, going back to close that gap once again. So all in all, the IWM on one hand looking healthy that it managed to close one gap and climbed higher. And then by the end of the day, closing yet another gap, but we did not see the reaction after closing the gap. So once again, keeping us on edge. On the bearish side, you could argue that the chart had the momentum in the morning to go all the way to 223, yet it did a U-turn way before that, and that is a signal of a lack of momentum, of weakness, not having enough fuel in the tank to go all the way to 223. Perhaps going back to 218, recharging, and then giving it another shot to climb all the way and reclaim 223. What about the daily chart for the RUT, the Russell 2000? Once again, keeping us on edge. No definitive closing one way or the other. The center of consolidation remains 2,264. Closing the week below that line, the bears have the advantage. Closing the week above that line, the bulls have the advantage. And the line in the sand remains 2,100. Closing the week below that will mean the floodgates will open for the Russell 2000. And by the way, here is a weekly chart for the rut. Clean, no markings, no annotations whatsoever. What's wrong with this chart? It is starting to lose a lot of momentum. This is the weekly chart, by the way, which holds a lot more weight than the daily and the 30 minutes charts. So when we start to see loss of momentum from a weekly perspective, that is a sign for danger ahead, that perhaps a correction 
is on the horizon because the chart is starting to lose momentum. And this is the first time the chart of the RUT started to lose momentum since the bottom of last year. So this is a significant event and this loss of momentum will not be just consolidation because the move pretty much been vertical to the upside. So you will see a massive flush down if indeed what the loss of momentum is indicating that there is a correction ahead for the Russell 2000. What about the Dixie, the dollar index? also keeping us on edge we were anticipating a definitive closing around the 90 level closing decisively above that level and the dollar index will continue to bounce higher and it will be a massive pop higher by the way closing decisively below this number 90 and the floodgates will open and we'll see the dollar breaking the lows of the year for now, the chart is keeping us hanging. But once again, I've been talking about a potential of a pop in the US dollar for a while now with no good luck, because every time we see a pop, it reverses quickly and the US dollar starts to roll down once again. But the formation the last three or four days is indicating that perhaps the US dollar is forming a bottom around the level of 90 and we will see that pop higher. Combine that information, by the way, with the weakness in the charts for the SPY, and the bullish bets for the VIX that the volatility index is anticipated to rise higher, if I am reading the tea leaves correctly, we will see a pop in the US dollar and that will come hand in hand with the resumption of the correction in the broader market. What about gold? What's going on here? Gold overbought from a daily perspective and it is looking for a top. The moment yields resume climbing higher once again, and by the way, yields are struggling to rise higher, and that is helping the US dollar to rise higher. But if we see the dollar index popping higher, as I expect, and yields resuming to climb higher, then gold will reverse. And once again, we're waiting and waiting and waiting for gold to break this trend, the inverse relationship between gold and the US dollar, excuse me, the 10-year treasury yield. Once that is broken, then I believe that gold is a good hedge against inflation. Absent of that, forget about it. Speaking of yields, and this is uh, once again one of those keeping us on the edge of our seats, every time we saw a pop in the 10-year treasury yield, whether it is after the CPI data or after the Fed minutes, that is quickly reversed and yields continue to hold at the level of support of 1.62 basis points. Now, breaking that level of support and you will see a flush down all the way perhaps to 1.55 basis points. However, if this support holds, yields retested it once, twice, and here comes the third testing. If it gets the all clear signal to rise higher, then the next destination for yields will be 1.7%. If that is broken and yields recapture 1.7%, then the next stop will be 2%. And again, if that happens and yields rise all the way to 2%, we will see another panic selling episode in the stock market. For now, we did not have a definitive conclusion one way or the other from the weekly closing in yields. What about the weekly closing in the TLT, bond prices, the inverse of yields, starting to gather some momentum here from a weekly perspective. So this is the tug of war. The fundamentals and the monetary policy says that yields should rise higher. Yet the technicals are in conflict. On one hand, yields are struggling to break above 1.7%. On the other hand, we have massive oversold conditions in the TLT, in addition to heavily shorted positions in the TLT, paving the way for a potential of an epic short squeeze. If it happens, but what will be the catalyst, the event that will ignite the short covering squeeze in the TLT? I talked about some data from last week that could hold the potential, and that is the Empire State Index and the Philly Manufacturing Index. Well, guess what? The Philly Manufacturing Index cooled off. So the headline number was favorable for the TLT to rise higher, but that still didn't happen. So we are once again in the indecision mode. And I am looking at 134.5, closing below that level from a weekly basis. A matter of fact, breaking that level from a daily perspective will signal that there is a lot more pain for bonds here and we will see yields popping higher to 1.7, perhaps surpassing that level. Now, is there a level in the TLT where if the chart closes above that level, I would say that, hey, watch out, the short squeeze is about to happen. I don't see any particular level on the TLT chart indicating that perspective. However, in the chart of the 10-year Treasury yield, there is a level, and that level is 1.5%. If yields break the 1.5% support, then in my opinion, that will unlock the short squeeze in the TLT.
What about the VIX? Daily perspective, once again, keeping us on the edge of our seats by not having a definitive closing one way or the other around the level of 20. Matter of fact, the VIX closing exactly at 20. We have a slight loss in momentum from a daily perspective. But once again, switching to the weekly perspective, take a look at the MACD and the RSI indicators. The pop in the VIX hasn't even started. This is at least according to the momentum indicators, the MACD and the RSI from a weekly perspective, a chart that holds more weight than the daily perspective. Moving on to Apple, the big kahuna. What's going on here? This is a weekly chart, no markings or annotations by me. And can you spot what's wrong with this chart, by the way? It tried three times to close decisively above. 140 145 only to fail this is the third time we see a turnaround as soon as apple chart reached 140 from a weekly perspective furthermore we're seeing a negative divergence in the rsi and we're seeing a curling back to the downside in the macd indicator the chart was gathering some momentum readying to make a crossing to the upside creating green impressions on the histogram that did not happen and we are seeing a reversal in the macd curling back downward what does that mean? It means that the chart is not ready to climb higher. It means that the chart doesn't have the momentum, the fuel in the tank to make higher highs, meaning that the chart will go down to support levels and ask market participants, would you like to hop in the ride and push Apple higher? Is 125 good enough for you to hop in? And if the answer is no, then the chart will go down to another lower support level, in this case 120, which happens to be the center of gravity, and ask the question once again. Any riders want to hop in and push this chart higher? And if the answer is still no, then Apple will go lower in search for support. Perhaps 117. Any takers? Any riders want to push this chart higher? And if the answer is yes, that will be a bottom and you will see Apple riding higher once again. And remember, as Apple goes, so will the Nasdaq. I don't care what the software names, what the chip manufacturers are doing. I care about the big kahuna, Apple. As Apple goes, so will the Nasdaq. And Friday's performance for Apple was not that promising. What about Tesla, the souffle? Rebounding higher. All in all, it was a good week for Tesla. We're seeing this oversold bounce. If you take a look at the RSI, we are seeing a potential for a curling upward in the MACD indicator, signaling perhaps a gathering of momentum. But Friday's candle is a little concerning, and this is why I continue to be hesitant to buy the dip in this name until I see how the name will react around the level of 540. If that support doesn't hold and we see a quick flush down, then guess what will happen? The chart will go down and close the gap all the way around the level of 400, meaning that Tesla stock will be 400 once again and by the way here is the daily chart the weekly chart says oversold conditions prompting a bounce the weekly chart saying not oversold matter of fact losing a lot of momentum and there are lower prices to go until and unless you see technical repair with a weekly chart and that will not happen by the way if the chart breaks 540 if the chart breaks 540 closing the week below that level for me at least that would be a signal to short all the way down to 400. And by the way, you know your uh, lord and savior, Reverend Elon Musk, your cult leader, the genius that he is, by buying Bitcoin and propping up cryptos, he now tied the price action in Tesla stock to the price action in Bitcoin. And we're seeing Bitcoin collapsing over the weekend. And if there is no recovery in Bitcoin and we see lower prices, then watch out here because Tesla will start to collapse very, very fast. And by the way, if Tesla stock starts to go down along with Bitcoin, guess what will happen? Your Lord and Savior, Reverend Elon Musk, who said, oh, I have diamond hands. Tesla has diamond hands. When it comes to Bitcoin, those diamond hands will turn to paper hands so fast. Your head will spin faster than a Tesla spinning around after crashing while being on autopilot moving on to the tulip market what's going on here the tulips not looking so good starting with bitcoin 42,000 was the center of gravity 42,000 was an important level to recapture for the bitcoiners and the crypto maniacs but now it looks like a clear rejection from 42,000 and now we're looking for the support of 30,000 if that doesn't hold oh boy it, it's just gonna get really really ugly it's gonna be a global event if Bitcoin cracks below 30,000 we have oversold conditions from a daily chart perspective so in theory 30,000 should hold but once again if you switch to the weekly perspective 
And I'm not going to do everything for you, but if you switch to the weekly perspective of Bitcoin, the chart is not really oversold and it is experiencing a significant loss in momentum. Meaning, from a weekly perspective, the longer term charts, regardless of the daily bounces, we are headed for lower prices. What about ETH? Ethereum also dropping like a rock and failing to recapture two important support levels, 2500 and 2900. And now Ethereum is trading well below those levels, so holding 2000 is critically important. But that is also being broken. And if that doesn't hold, then the chart will go down all the way to 1375. And that should be a solid support because you have a long period of consolidation in that zone between 1375 and 2000. The question is, will the sideliners who've been waiting and waiting and waiting to buy ETH hop in the ride and buy the dip if it goes all the way down to 1375? The sentiment is extremely important for the future of cryptos. What about Doge? Elon the Khan is losing his magic and now it doesn't matter whether he pops or pumps, tries to manipulate, doesn't matter. The pumps nowadays last for a few hours before quickly reversing. What does that say? The faith in Reverend Elon Musk is turning around. And you can see that by the comments, by the way. A lot of people are saying, hey, you made me lose money. Why don't you start pumping again? What's going on here? And of course, the coiners are turning against each other. Your tulip is bad. No, your tulip is bad. And it is becoming a terrible situation for cryptos. And by the way, the support here for Dogecoin is around 21 cents. So breaking that level, and you know where it's going, by the way. It's going down to zero. This is the intrinsic value of Dogecoin. Zero. Absent of Elon Musk taking over entirely and turning Dogecoin into a reliable currency, at least for his businesses, Tesla, SpaceX, etc. Absent of that, there is zero intrinsic value in Dogecoin. Moving on to the conclusion of this video. What do we have on the economic calendar tomorrow? Nothing. And matter of fact, it is a muted quiet week for the economic calendar. The most important day for the week will be Friday because we have personal income, consumer spending, core inflation, the Chicago PMI, and the consumer sentiment index. And this will be the final reading, by the way, for the month of May. Lastly, let's wrap up with this. We are witnessing record selling by hedge funds. And once again, I see this in my own practice. The sentiment has changed. This whole thing about stocks only go up and the belief that the tsunami of liquidity and spending by the monetary and fiscal policy is good for stocks, that is changing because we have the late adapters. We have the early adapters who already saw the move ahead of time. For example, this channel. We saw right away that inflation will rise higher because the Fed is just going to eyeball inflation with no formula and no framework. And therefore, I told you back then that the market will become a stock picker's market and the inflationary trade will outperform. But there is a limit if inflation continues to get out of hand. Meanwhile, we're not seeing a recovery in the market in terms of employment and the likes. That will lead to stagflation. Stagflation is not good for the stock market, regardless of the sectors. And you're seeing that sentiment turning around, not just from retail traders and investors, but also institutionals and insiders. Matter of fact, insider selling is reaching epic levels and when it comes to the selling pressure we have witnessed in the last few weeks the most concentrated selling pressure in the history of the stock market this is not a coincidence it is not a one-time event it is not just a momentary scare in the market it is a shift in sentiment that perhaps the good days of putting your blindfold on picking tickers out of a hat that is over and now we have a very difficult terrain to navigate. And by the way, you're seeing all of these YouTubers, they are superstars from last year, absolutely sucking this year because the market is not easy anymore. During a bull market, everybody's a genius. But when the market turns around, it becomes an extremely difficult terrain to navigate. And that is impacting the sentiment or we're seeing legitimate de-risking in the market across the board. I don't intend to make this video any longer, but my advice to you is the following. Use option strategies and use your head, matter of fact, to de-risk at this point and at this time in the stock market. Take a look at your portfolio. Which stocks went too high? Why not trimming some of the gains, booking some profits? And if you're not ready for that, why not buy some puts as insurance to protect your positions from a steep decline? And if you are still bullish in certain names, why not sell some puts? If you still believe in the name, selling puts will help you raise cash 
And if the stock goes down to that level, you get to buy it again from that particular strike price. Using option strategies becomes extremely important in times like these in the stock market. Anyhow, that's all I got for you tonight, and I will talk to you again tomorrow. If you found the information presented in this video helpful, please subscribe, press the like button, the notification button, and follow me on social media.